you come to Ara and you're inextricably linked to nature. For many it's out of sight, out of mind, but the marine environment and our seas is so important for the ecological connectivity of Aran's natural world. The community of Aran Seabed Trust, or Coast as more commonly known, have worked really hard since the mid-90s to protect our marine environment around here. There was a massive decline in fish stocks in our seas and a lot of habitat destruction due to unsustainable fishing. In 2008, the Lamlash Bay No-Take Zone was established and this is a living laboratory that proves just what can recover if you protect a marine environment. It's an area of no fishing and it's the only area of its sort in Scotland. In 2016, the much larger South Arran Marine Protected Area was brought into force to protect fragile marine habitats from unsustainable fishing. Habitats that are protected are found in the waters right behind me. In these waters we have things called merl, which is a coralline pink seaweed. It's very, very slow growing and extremely vulnerable to bottom fishing methods. We've also got seagrass meadows. So seagrass is an underwater flowering plant um, and both merl and seagrass provide habitat for lots and lots of different species. They're vital blue carbon habitats, so they help us as humans as they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and retain it within their structures, meaning it's helping us combat climate change. Juvenile fish use seagrass meadows as nursery habitats and of course you get the bigger fish that come and feed on them and then the bigger marine megafauna that feed off the larger fish. Things like dolphins and porpoise that everybody loves to see. Basking sharks are Scotland's biggest fish in our seas and they are seasonal visitors to Arran's waters. Often seen between June and October but your best months are August and September. They cruise along the surface of the water, you see their dorsal fin followed by their tail fin gliding through the water just poking up above the surface. As they're doing this, they're feeding. They have huge big mouths which they open and they filter gallons of water through their gills. They force the water out and capture little plankton in their gill plates before swirling their tongue round and swallowing them. Fun fact about basking shark, although you could quite comfortably fit inside its mouth, it would be hard pushed to swallow you because their throat is the size of a human fist. The marine habitats we protect within the South Iron Marine Protected Area don't just support the cool megafauna like your seals and your dolphins, also support our coastline birds, many of which we have on Arran, from oyster catchers to gannets to black guillemots. These animals all rely on our seas being a healthy place in order to survive. Other species that we are also protecting by protecting our habitats within the sea are everyone's favourite, the Eurasian otter, which we commonly see around Arran's coastlines. Now both the otter and the harbour seal are two of Scotland's big five animals. We're lucky enough on Arran to have all five, so look elsewhere in the island for your golden eagle, red deer and red squirrels to see what you might find. One of the fantastic aspects of my job is that I'm looking after habitats right from the seashore right to the very summit of Goat Fell. One of the most interesting things I'm doing this summer is monitoring the adder population in Glen Rosa. What's so fascinating about adders is they're UK's only venomous snakes. And that means they can actually give you a really rather nasty bite. So you don't want to get too close to them. If, as long as you stay one metre away from an adder, then you'll more or less be safe. When you see an adder, what you'll see is a, a lovely snake which has a really strong zigzag pattern down its back and an underlying colour which can be brown in the females or can be silvery grey in the males. But one of the amazing things here in Glen Rosa is we also get black adders. So all the adder is black. The juvenile adders are even more dramatic as they're brick red with a very orange zigzag down their back. The reason I'm monitoring adders in Glen Rosa is because we are, through our management, changing this habitat by planting trees. And we want to make sure that that's not affecting the adder population. Adders in the rest of Britain are in decline. It's a wonderful glen to see the shape that's been made by the glacier. The geology determines everything. 
it has to suit the trees. And in different parts of the island, there's different geology, very different. We've got the highlands and the lowlands in this island, which is marvellous. You've got that dividing line, so you can look at both sides. Uh, and the, the soils on the south end of the island are much more sustainable than this kind of soil. This is very thin, acid soil. If this doesn't have a forest on it, it just becomes a desert very quickly, within a hundred years or so. And there's virtually nothing left here to eat. As it is at the moment, this is uh, purple moor grass or, or millennia grass, and the seeds can't fall through it. This, this is the end game. Nothing else comes after this, and everything else dies under it. So it's an absolute disaster. But this, only, this is only here because all the nutrients have been taken out of the soil, and it's the only plant that will grow. So if you visualize, maybe. I don't know how many years you would put onto it, maybe a thousand years after the, the glaciers had gone, you would certainly, this would be a forested area with, with trees like this on the birch and the aspen. Then the oak forest would come in once the, the soil started to build up with the dang mosses and the leaf litter. And eventually this, this glen was at one time filled with oaks. We know that because of the fauna that's left in the different parts of the glen. The, the aspen trees on the cliffs here will probably date from that time. When, when it became obvious to me that the, the landscape as it, as it stands is not the, the way it should be, I felt I wanted to do something about it. What you see here is the, the, the beginning of a, a recovery for the, the guy, to put it back um, into a state where it will support far more bird life, animal life, and um, it's even possible in the future you could have beavers here if you had enough trees. <laughs> um, but certainly I, I would like to see uh, wild boar reintroduced because they are a, a, a very important part of the forest. These are creatures that plough up the ground uh, for the seed. I've been planting trees sometimes surreptitiously, other times with the permission, but really just growing trees from local seed and uh, planting them wherever I could get a bit of ground to do it on. This is a, a arm white beam, uh, it's an armensis, a uh, very beautiful tree, uh, very rare, one of the rarest in the world. It'll be in flower soon, it's got beautiful white flowers and in the autumn it's got marvellous berries which the birds love. We've planted a few hundred in this glen and hopefully they'll be safe here for future generations. The history of the deer here is, it goes back as far as we, we know as human beings. The, there's an early account in one of the first Irish books of the Irish kings coming to Ireland to hunt the deer. So there's no doubt the deer were here and, and would have probably have got here by their own device at the end of the Ice Age. The deer definitely have an impact in not allowing the, the trees to regenerate now, but there's no doubt that over the history of the island, it would be man that would have got rid of the trees in the first place. But you've also got to remember at certain points in our, and even in, in my youth, the levels of sheep population on the hills on the island were an awful lot more than there is now. The, the island at certain points had huge heavy sheep populations way beyond deer population that would have had an impact too. The deer on the island are one of the major players about the whole environment. They dominate so much of the landscape and the, they feed on the flora and fauna that's there so impact on it, especially if the numbers get to above uh, certain levels. In the right density, they have a positive impact, but if it gets too high, they have a negative impact. And especially if you were trying to regenerate trees or anything like that, it's, it becomes very difficult. The only predator that deer will have in this part of the world, apart from humans, is the golden eagle. The golden eagle will take young calves and we have actually a video footage of eagles chasing deer over cliffs to create carrion for them to feed on.
I've travelled up quite a bit of the west coast of Scotland. Actually, Arran is one of the best places for actually seeing deer from the roadside, specifically over from Sanax leading through to here in Lochranza. The deer are wild animals and they should be kept as wild animals and they've got a bit tamer in this part of the world and just be a bit careful around the tamer deer rather than the wilder deer and give them the respect and the distance and let them have their own bit of space. We're blessed on Arran with these fantastic beaches and we've got the Arran Coastal Way which means we can explore the coastlines and we'll see lots and lots of wildlife while we do it. Try and stay below the high tide mark or stick to the path. The reason for that is that we have lots of nesting birds at the, during the breeding season, things like ringed plover, oyster catcher, common gull, uh, and they tend to nest between the high tide mark and um, the kind of higher bits of the foreshore. So if you stay below the high tide mark or you stick to the path, you're not going to be disturbing them. Where's the high tide mark? It's really easy to spot. You'll see this line of seaweed. If you walk below that, you won't be disturbing any nests. Or alternatively, um, stick to the coastal way path which exists around the coast in a number of places. And if you're on the path, um, you're not gonna be disturbing any wildlife. And of course, keep your dogs on the lead during the breeding season. I'm sat here in front of some harbour seals, sometimes also called common seals. And they like to haul out on the rocks all around the coast of Arran. They do that for a couple of really important reasons. Uh, when they're in the water, uh, the blood supply to some of their vital organs gets cut off. It's how they kind of conserve heat and oxygen. Uh, so things like um, their skin and also their digestive system um, don't have a kind of full blood supply when they're in the water. So they come out on land to do really essential things like digest their food uh, and to molt. Uh, and it's really important that they're not disturbed while they're doing that because otherwise they can get quite out of condition. So how can we enjoy watching the seals without disturbing them? Well, my first top tip is a set of these um, because that allows us to get really, really, really good views without getting too close to them. The other thing is just uh, keep an eye on their behavior. What tends to happen is we, we, we sneak up on them and we try and get as close as we can and we never know whether we're too close until it's too late so they slip into the water. And once they've slipped into the water, it's too late. So my little rule of thumb is if the seals are looking at me, then I know that they're aware of my presence and I shouldn't really be getting any closer. If you don't get too close and you do have a set of binoculars, you can see totally natural behaviour. So instead of seeing them watching me, I see them doing things like fighting and farting and wriggling uh, and just being natural seals, which is always a lot of fun. So Aaron's really special for its geology and the geology underpins everything, um, including the wildlife that we find here. So behind me, we've got these lines of rocks, which are basalt dikes that formed when North America and the west coast of Scotland were kind of breaking apart about 60 million years ago. Molten basalt welled up into the cracks in the Earth's crust. It was much harder than the surrounding bedrock. So the sea has washed away the surrounding bedrock and left these lines of rocks like little walls that are standing proud. These are brilliant because they, they're fantastic for biodiversity. It's a rocky shore. We've got lots of seaweed, um, crustaceans, mollusks, but it's also providing shelter from the prevailing winds and currents, uh, which is just perfect for mammals such as seals and otters to go hunting and fishing for their food. So one of the great projects I've been doing is restoring peatlands high up on the moor above there where we've got bogs that have been eroded by people digging drainage ditches across the bog. In the 1950s they thought it would improve the grazing for sheep. However, all it did was destroy a functioning bog and it meant that we lost peat and soil into the surrounding area. So now what we're doing is restoring the peatlands by putting dams across the ditches. This refloats the bog and allows the peats to restore and stops us losing peat and also means that the bogs can capture carbon for the future. Here you can see sphagnum moss. This is a very special plant as it just grows from the tip here 
and then the bottom of the plant decays away to form the peat. So by restoring our upland bogs what we're doing is trapping carbon from our environment and our atmosphere and storing it for millennia and that helps us with climate change it also helps us with flooding because sphagnum moss the other thing it can do is hold lots and lots of water so when we have huge downpours the sphagnum moss can hold and trap that water and slowly release it to prevent flooding lower down in the glens and in the valleys peatlands are also a fantastic habitat for all sorts of animals including one of our rarest species of bird, the hen harrier, which can nest way up onto the moor there and is a ground nesting bird. So one of the reasons Aaron is so special for hen harrier is because we don't have any ground predators here. We don't have foxes, stoats or weasels, which means hen harriers can nest really well without being predated. So here is one of the specialist plants that lives on our bogs and our peatlands and it's called a sundew. This plant gains its nutrients by attracting midges to it. So the midges land on the leaves and then the leaves curl over it and then start to digest the midge and that's how it gets its nutrients. One of the amazing things you can see if you come to a trip to Aaron are golden eagles. There are at least three pairs of golden eagles in the island, so you have a good chance of spotting one, especially if you go to some of the remoter glens or look up at crags like the ones behind us. But the best place to see them is in Mokranza. If you go to the distillery car park and get out your car, you could have a good chance of seeing a golden eagle. A lot of people come and ask me, have I seen a golden eagle or have I seen a buzzard? So here we are. Here are the two birds, and I'll tell you some of the differences. This is a buzzard, and as you can see, it's quite a big bird, four foot wingspan, but it's nothing compared to the golden eagle here, which has a six foot wingspan. Really broad, long, square wings. As you look up at the sky, you'll see a really, really big bird. The buzzard is quite pale underneath, um, whereas the golden eagle will look really dark and if you're lucky you might see the hint of gold on its head. If your golden eagle is going pew 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 then it's a buzzard. It can be quite confusing. People see buzzards sitting by the roadside with their very yellow legs and think it's an eagle but eagles tend to be soaring high above the crags. This is what I love about my job, is I'm here and I'm helping conserve this landscape and I'm restoring habitats and helping all the various creatures and animals that live here and hopefully future-proofing it so that more and more species can make their home here and be protected from climate change. But another aspect of my job that I really enjoy is getting people involved, so taking them out into this landscape and getting them to understand a bit more of the nature on their doorstep and maybe actually get involved and come and help us plant trees and really feel that this they're connected to with nature around them. So in 20 years time what will this scene look like? We'll have a lot more woodland in the glen um, but we'll still have open spaces but in the woodland there'll be more insect life and more bird life and that will bring biodiversity into the glen and hopefully people have been involved in it and they will feel a part of this project and feel that they are helping preserve the landscape, help the wildlife and Aran will be just an amazing place for many, many, many years to come. <laughs>